2014 has been a year of broken records. The stock market surged to new highs, oil is at a four-year low. There have been mergers, spin-offs, and upstarts shaking up industries at every turn. Today, we bring you Fortune Live, our first ever year in review. We'll talk to industry leaders, investors, and members of our award-winning staff to break down what made 2014 such an exciting year in business. Let's take a look back. Unbelievable problem. At least 13 people dead. So you don't know how long GM knew about this, and that's right? Why I've... Yes or no, we'll work. We know that now. Sony has been subject to what some say is the most devastating hack of the year. Home Depot had been hacked. Target, J.P. Morgan Chase, look at all the other companies that have succumbed to hacks. A growing group of big corporations are fleeing the country to get out of paying taxes. This is really big. This is a big IPO. This is going to be over $20 billion. This is Moonshot. This is the Google philosophy. Going for the crazy tech idea like, you know, self-driving cars and drones. Amazon, Google, and now DHL are all interested in drone delivery. We have one more thing. <laughs> Apple's chief executive Tim Cook recently revealed that he's gay. I'll make it easier for high-skilled immigrants to stay and contribute to our economy. The wreckage of flight MH17 is still smoldering in the drizzle. Uber is in hot water once again. Welcome to Fortune Live 2014 Year in Review. I'm Lee Gallagher. Joining us for our first ever live show here on Fortune.com is Fortune editor Alan Murray, assistant managing editor Brian O'Keefe, and technology editor Andrew Nuska. What a year it's been, gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Alan, we're going to start with you. This Sony hacking story has been all over the news. It gets bigger every day. Just today, President Obama weighed in saying this. Take a look. Sony's a corporation. It uh, you know, suffered significant damage. There were threats against its employees. Uh, I am sympathetic to the concerns uh, that uh, they faced. Having said all that, yes, I think they made a mistake. Alan, do you agree uh, with the President? Was well, it a mistake? let's leave aside for a minute whether they should or should not have released the, the film, which is what the President was talking about there. I, by the way, if you look at Rotten Tomatoes, the people who've seen the film aren't that wild about it anyway. So I'm not sure <laughs> we're hugely deprived by Sony's decision. But there is no question that cybersecurity is the story of the year. Remember, I mean, the Sony thing has gotten a lot of press. It's very embarrassing. But we also had Home Depot, massive hack at Home Depot. We had J.P. Morgan. Uh, I was in an event a few months ago with the CIOs of, a, of about 100 very large companies. They all said that they now spend between 25 and 50 percent of their time on cybersecurity. When the best and the brightest technology uh, uh, engineers uh, uh, of our country and our economy have to spend a quarter to a half of their time on cybersecurity. We have a big, big economic problem. Well, George Clooney thinks so too. Academy, the Academy Award winner also had this to say about the issue. We're talking about an actual country deciding what content we're going to have. This affects not just movies. This affects every part of business that we have. That's the truth. Brian, uh, what's your take on that? Does this really impact every part of business? Absolutely. I mean, to echo what Alan said, I mean, didn't even mention Target, another huge uh, hack and, and a CEO who lost his job partly as a result. And I think you see in boardrooms around the country that um, it's not just the technologists, it's the CEOs and the board members trying to wrap their heads around this. And because, you know, any company can have uh, an outsider get in and take their secrets and expose them and expose private information of their customers, which is a, a huge threat. Uh, you know, I, I love the line, uh, uh, Lee, that someone, two-thirds of American companies say they have been hacked, the other third just don't know it. Uh, that's kind of where we are. But what about this issue of censorship, though? I mean, Andrew, do you think that this is something, I mean, the president in his remarks also mentioned that the fear is that companies might start to self-censor and not and factor this into their decisions before they even release products to market or say or something like that. What's your take on that? Yeah, I mean that's definitely a worry, right? We're in the information business here at Fortune, and that, that's that's terrible to think about, right? Um, at the same time, you know, as Alan said, we don't know what's already been censored. It's kind of a you know the the thing you don't know uh, scenario, and, and all the companies are thinking about what to do. You know, the thing 
that has uh, stru stuck with me the most about this is it's kind of good that it's out there in the open. This year has been all about cybersecurity, and it's, it's finally bringing it to the forefront. It seems to be a board issue now. And for years, companies were just getting hacked and they didn't want to talk about it. But this brings up another issue. We, the epicenter of technology is Silicon Valley. We should own this. Why aren't we able to prevent these hacks? And what's happening in the race to start trying to prevent them? Yeah, I mean, you know, cybersecurity, that, that, the whole thing just levels the playing field, right? And that's why it's so hard. I mean, you have to defend against virtually everyone. And so what's been interesting for me watching it in the technology industry is there's a change of mindset. So companies are moving from this idea that they can keep people out, out of the castle. Here's the moat, here's the bridge, we'll keep them out. And they're kind of assuming that they're going to get in the walls anyway, and how can they kind of isolate them? So there's this switch in mentality, and I think that Silicon Valley and any, any, all the other technology companies are looking at that. I have to say, Andrew, one of the surprising things to me about this, uh, about this Sony hack is that the North Koreans really have the competence to do this. Do we really think that it was North Korea that did this uh, remarkable hack? You know, it seems to be still a, just a very hotly debated thing, but here's the truth. It could be anybody in any basement, right? As long as you have an internet connection and some smarts around computers, you can do this too. That's, and that's what's scary. That's the scary part indeed. I want to switch gears for a second. Markets went wild this year. Uh, stock surged. Oil is now at a four-year low. Brian, how did oil fall so far and so fast? Well, it's been something that's been building up for a while because you had, uh, uh, you've had surging supply, especially in the United States, and slowing and flattening demand around the world. In the United States, we've been becoming more efficient. Growth around the world has kind of slowed down, you know, not quite what people thought it was going to be. You saw oil production in the United States for 20 years, starting in the early 80s, dropping. And now it's just rocketed up because of the oil shale revolution in the United States. So the United States is going past 9 million barrels a day of production, and it's just flooded the, the market with oil. And I think it's dropped. It's not surprising that it dropped. It's surprising that it dropped as quickly, as sharply as it did. But it's not just supply, Alan. It's demand, too, right? Well, it is, it is demand, too. It, it, it reflects a slowdown in the developing world. China is not growing at the rate that it was growing a couple of years ago, so it's a mixed bag. To me, what's been so fascinating about this past year is that in, in previous times, a sharp drop in the price of oil would have been an unalloyed good thing. You know, we all get gas uh, more cheaply. That's great. But because of the uh, shale revolution, the explosion in U.S. production, we're now a much bigger producer of oil, and the companies that produce that oil are, hu are a huge part of the U.S. stock market. It's been a mixed bag. It has clobbered the stock market even as we get to drive uh, uh, with lower prices at the pump. And what's your take on, you know, are we looking at sub-$60 oil for all of 2015, or, or do you think it could bounce back? That's you, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Forecast on. <laughs> My gut is that it will bounce back at some point, but it might be a while. We might go, we might go below 50. We and might OPEC go below 40. OPEC has said it's going to go below 40. Exactly. Yeah, it might. I think that um, I think long term, there's there's reasons that I would think that oil will bounce back because of, you know, aside from oil shale in the United States, most of the new oil that's being developed costs more to develop. But right now, the momentum is all going one way. I think the market's been flooded with oil, and we don't know exactly where it's going to bottom out. I want to switch a bit. Uh, we're going to move now to people. I want each of you to answer, and I'm going to start with you, Andrew. Which business leader had the biggest impact in 2014? What do you think? you got to go with Apple CEO Tim Cook. I mean, <laughs> his announcing that he's gay is just a, a water mar you know, watershed moment for Fortune 500 companies, for companies of all different sizes. I mean, to, to quite literally come out there and, and say to the world, you know, this is okay, and it's not going to affect our business in a meaningful way, I think is a really strong message. And oh, by the way, the iPhone 6 was a hit, and yeah. the stock's up 40% or something okay. like that. So. Okay, so Brian, who's your pick? Uh, I think the Pope. I got to go with the Pope. Uh, you know, he's, uh, he's established himself as probably the most popular Pope in maybe centuries. But, uh, you know, and the latest thing he's done now apparently is broker this deal with the United States and Cuba or have a, a big role in that. And, uh, you know, he's an amazing leader. Good answer, Alan. Did you ask business leaders or uh, leaders generally? I mean, the Good Pope question. actually has become a business he, I would leader. Say so he's I think a business that's leader legit. at this it's he's also, what he's he's also at the doing a, a turn, business turnaround at the Vatican. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It is business leader though. So, business, what, so what's business your answer? leader? Well, well, look. I mean, this isn't a, this isn't an entirely good story. But Mary Barra has been a fascinating figure to watch. It was at the very beginning of the year that General Motors. She she became late last year became the CEO of General Motors, first woman to have that mm -hmm. position. And then at the beginning of the year, the massive recall and. 
she was called before Congress. Very tough, very difficult to deal with. I don't think we know yet how that's going to turn out, but certainly somebody who grabbed a lot of our attention over the course of the year. And now we're going to do a lightning round. I'm going to ask each of you, 2014 was the year of X. Alan, one word. One word, a couple words. <laughs> well, Uber, but can I elaborate on that? Sure. Because I don't think car sharing services are the most important thing in the world. But I do think Uber is a, a sign of where we are headed in the economy, that you're seeing more and more of these companies that combine the characteristics of firms with the characteristics of uh, marketplaces. And so, you know, you have an Uber for drinks, you have an Uber for massages, you have an Uber for laundry, and, and you have more and more big companies talking about sort of Uber-like platforms that they're creating in the company. So I, th I, I think it's huge. Ryan, what about you? I'd say energy, but we already touched on that. So I'll say, <laughs> okay, say activist investors, okay. I think, which is something we haven't touched on. And it's been, I think activist investors are more influential than ever in the market and in the boardroom. I mean, you saw Icon, uh, you know, extracting money out of Apple. So it's a big and story. And we, can, I, can we elaborate sure. on that? Because also Jeff Smith, who, who went after uh, uh, Olive Garden and uh, uh, Red Lobster and John Oliver. Darden uh, Restaurants. Yeah, uh, Darden Restaurants, yeah. Great. And Andrew, quickly, 2014. I, I got to go with Ebola. We can't ignore the fact that this disease you know, completely just arrested everyone across the world. They were worried about it coming to their country, even though, it, you know, I mean, that kind of, uh, that kind of hit, you, you got you to go with Ebola. Great idea as well. Good point. Um, gentlemen, I want to thank you for being with me. Uh, 2014 was quite a year, but now it's time to push forward. Coming up next, I'll sit down with the CEO of the Herjavec Group, Shark Tank's own Robert Herjavec. But first, technology is about much more than keeping company data safe. Perhaps no company has been as adept at keeping up with changes in tech than Disney, which is involved with everything from movies to broadcasts to video games and theme parks. Fortune senior editor Michal Levram recently sat down with Disney CEO Bob Iger, and technology was front of mind for him. So you have three pillars here at Disney, three guiding principles. Can you kind of briefly explain what they are? Yes, we have three strategic priorities as a company. The first and probably the biggest is to embrace storytelling and creativity. In our case, creating high quality branded content. We have such great brands as a company from Disney, to ESPN and ABC and Marvel and Pixar and Lucasfilm and Star Wars that we believe the best way to create value for our shareholders is to tell great stories under those brand banners or umbrellas. So that's where we invest most of our time and most of our capital. The second, and but almost as important by the way, is the use of technology. We use technology in different ways. I'd say the most important is to tell our stories better. Technology is the friend of the storyteller because it gives the storyteller tools to tell the story even better. And the stories that we tell are told in multiple forms, from movies to TV shows to theme park attractions, and technology is playing more and more of a role. Another reason to use or embrace technology is to distribute far more ubiquitously or broadly. We have these great tools today to reach more people in more places at more times. Mobile technology, a great example of that. Let's use them. Let's be at the forefront of all of that change so that we can reach more people with the stories that we tell. We also use technology to get closer to our customers. One of the great things about technology today is that it provides us the tools to know who our customers are, to hear what our customers want, what they like, and to improve the experiences that we have with them using the data that we glean from the experiences that they have. And that's a great opportunity, not just for the customer, but obviously for the company. And then the third pillar is growing internationally. We've had an international footprint as a company dating all the way back to Walt Disney's day, but we have decided that we have opportunities to grow that footprint, to not just be basically broad in, in a variety of markets around the world, but to deeply penetrate those markets. And one great example of that is what we're doing in China today, particularly with the construction of Shanghai Disneyland. Welcome back to Fortune Live. I'm Lee Gallagher. You know him as one of the investors on ABC's hit show Shark Tank, where regular Joes go on TV hoping to land an investment from business all-stars. Joining me now for our first ever installment of The Exchange on Fortune Live is CEO of the Herjavec Group, Robert Herjavec. 
Robert, thanks for joining us. We're so glad to have you here. Thanks for having me, Lee. So uh, you are you're a, an incredible success story. You've um, started and sold two tech companies. You're on your third. It's an IT security company. We're going to talk about Shark Tank, but before I go there, I got to ask you, talk to us about the Sony hack, which is the biggest story of the week. What is your perspective on it? It's incredible. You know, what? what's to us in the industry, this is a seminal kind of attack. What we saw a year ago with the Target attack was we saw executive level exposure. The CEO of Target was fired for the breach. We saw board level interest in a computer breach. This never happened before. A year later, we're seeing foreign governments attack private corporations and stealing personal data. Just yesterday, there was a class action lawsuit launched by the employees of Sony. We just put together a document for Sony to distribute to their tens of thousands of employees, telling them to get new credit cards, change their pins, change their passwords, change their internet access at home. So it seems that it's getting worse and worse, and the severity is ratcheting up. Are you surprised something like this took this long to happen? Is this something that you knew was a, was a very strong possibility? We've been talking about this for a long time. What we've been telling people is you have to know what good is. The challenge is most companies that are breached have been breached for six months and they just don't know about it. And what you're seeing now is a lot of these companies are issuing insurance claims. And some of the claims we've seen are $100 million, $50 million. And the insurance companies want the companies to tell them, tell me what good looked like before the breach. And very few companies can do that. So what's the next step? We predict that there'll be the next level of attack will cause the loss of human life or a physical infrastructure or something along that line. It's going to get much worse before it gets better. How far away are we from something like that? Not to be overly ominous uh, here. But I, I don't think we're that far away. Mm -hmm. We A year ago, the Brazilian power infrastructure was brought down for about an hour by hackers, widely known. Uh, we're not that far away from it. Let's shift gears to something on a lighter note. Uh, talk to us about Shark Tank. This show has been uh, Emmy winning. You just did the 100th episode, uh, a hit by any standards, let alone for a business show. What, what is it about this show? Yeah, that's, that's, what, what core does it It's funny you say that because we really are a business show. We're, we, we're entertainment that happens to be around business less so the business show that happens to be entertaining. You know, when we started doing the show, we weren't allowed to use the word valuation. If somebody came out and said, I'm looking for 100,000 for 10% of my business, the sharks would say, you have a million dollar value on your business? The producers would come along and go, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Too complicated for the American audience. Today, we use debentures, we use buybacks, royalties. I think it proves that there's a real interest in business in America today. And do you think part of the show's success is that it's really offering people a, a shot at the American dream? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's funny to me, as I travel across the United States, how many Americans tell me there is no opportunity in America. But when I travel the world, America is still the land of opportunity. And, and I think that's what our show tells America, is you've got six sharks, we're really not that smart, we really don't have any talent, we can't sing, we can't dance, we can't perform, but we're pretty good at making money. And we're the only show where you have to have no talent and you can change your life. Your life is actually very interesting. Um, your story really uh, typifies the sort of uh, work ethic that we sometimes hear about, the, the sort of classic version of the immigrant hustle. Okay, You, you, you came to uh, Canada with your family at age eight, fleeing the former Yugoslavia uh, with little, and built a fortune of your own. Uh, do you think that really sort of fueled who you are and your successes that you've had? Yeah, absolutely. I always, you know, me and Kevin, who's the mean bald guy on our show, always argue about this. He says people start a business to make money. I always say nobody starts a great business for a paycheck. Everybody who I've met, uh, Kevin from Under Armour, everybody who I've met that wants to build a great business has a burning passion and desire to be great at something. My dad escaped from jail to bring us to this country. And I, I can see Mark Cuban rolling his eyes right now, but it's true, we came here with one suitcase. That man worked so hard to give me an opportunity in this life. I, I've always felt this need to do something great with my life. And I think that is the typical immigrant story.
And you make a great point that right now starting businesses is, is very glamorous. It's where all the, the hot startup activity and where all the money's going. But you know, back then, when someone came to this country, you started a business because there was no other option. You had to make a dollar. That was, that was right. the only option. Well, well, my dad had no choice, and I had no choice. I had to start a business. I got fired. The only reason I started my own business is I got fired, and I couldn't find a job quickly enough to make the next mortgage payment. Wow. Isn't, I mean, it's remarkable. Yeah. Mark Cuban will say he knew he wanted to be a business man since he was 11 years old. And you can, you can come from both sides of it. But today is the best time in history to start a business because you have access through cloud computing and uh, resources as anybody else. It's also the worst time to start a business because there's so much competition. Well, that's the thing, and and right now we're in an era where uh, you know there's there's valuations of some privately held businesses in the tech world. Look at Uber, Airbnb, some of these other companies. It's incredible. They are enormous and they keep rising. Uh, what's your take on the current state of things? Do you think we're in a tech bubble? I actually don't think we're in a tech bubble because the difference between this tech bubble and the last tech bubble in 2000 was these companies actually make money. Uber makes money. Airbnb makes money. Before, they were just ideas. The market values people who change environments. Uber has completely changed the way we get a cab. I mean, I, I know kids today that are thinking, how did the world exist before Uber? It, it, so I think that the market values when you can change something fundamentally like that. You um, are a great source of advice for entrepreneurs, obviously. You just did a piece recently on the 10 tips for, for entrepreneurs. Can you give, give us one of them? Yeah, one of my, one of my favorites is uh, bring a compass because it's always uncomfortable to have to eat your friends. You know, you, you never want to get lost in the woods. It is amazing to me how many people in their careers or when they start a business don't know where they're going. I mean, they have this general feeling of, I want to be successful, but they don't know what success looks like. And the reality in business is, every day you're going to fail at something. Every day you're going to make a mistake. And it's that immediate feedback that you adjust for to know where to keep going. If you don't know where you're going, you're going to fail. You have another tip I really like involving Tom Brady. Tell us about that one. <laughs> yeah, I, I, when I do speeches, I always say to people, because people say, oh, you know, I like to do a lot of different things. And my tip is always Tom Brady gets paid $10 million a year to be a quarterback, to throw the ball. He doesn't tackle. He doesn't run with it. He gets paid $10 million to throw the ball. If you want to compete at a world-class level, you got to be great at one thing. Because if you're not, you're going to come across a guy like me that's great at something else. So the smaller you are, the more focused and the greater and narrower your focus needs to be. Play to your strengths. Robert, thank you so much for being with yeah, us today. Thanks, really Lee. appreciate it. Thank you and best of luck. Coming up next, we'll make some predictions for 2015 with Fortune's Jennifer Reingold and Dan Roberts. But first, here's Fortune contributor Sue Calloway, who recently took Lamborghini's new Huracan for a spin. Watch this. Gone are the days when driving a Lamborghini was like wrestling a bull. The handling was rough, the ride was even rougher, and few things worked well. Meet the Huracan, Lamborghini's new entry-level brute that replaces the beloved Gallardo. Like its predecessor, it's a mid-engine V10 primed with all-wheel drive. But those similarities aside, the Huracan is another animal entirely. With a zero to 60 of just 2.5 seconds, the Huracan is faster than its competitors. But wait! It's also faster than its older brother, the Aventador. Today, I'm going to put it through its paces in the Malibu Canyons and see what I can get out of it. The first thing somebody should do when driving a Huracan is, of course, decide how to drive the Huracan. Street mode, sport mode, or race mode. You can feel an incredible difference, especially in the suspension setting. I love the graphics. I love the fighter jet feeling of all the toggle switches. You've got digital and analog readouts. The car is active and engaged and working with you and telling you things. One of the things I don't like about the Huracan is how Lamborghini prices. $7,000 for sports suspension, $3,200 for navigation. Shouldn't a $240,000 sports car come with that stuff anyway? But one optional excess I do think is worth the money, the $7,000 for the glass bonnet over the engine. Why wouldn't you want to expose something so stunning? 
Well, after a day of hammering it hard, I can tell you the Huracan is a serious contender. It can hold its own against 911 turbos and Ferrari 458s. The fact that it has all the proper technology now makes it a killer. In fact, the Huracan earns Lamborghini a badge that would once have been an oxymoron, an authentic, refined, and reliable Lamborghini. Welcome back to Fortune Live. We've already taken a look back at the year that was 2014, and now we'd like to make some bold predictions for the business world in 2015. It's our crystal ball segment, and joining us to help forecast the future is Fortune Senior Editor Jennifer Reingold and Writer Reporter Dan Roberts. Guys, thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. Jen, let me start with you. What major business trend do you think is going to be big next year? Well, something I think is going to happen next year is we're going to see the end of Black Friday. All this talk being open, Thanksgiving night, Christmas Day practically. It's all happening, and what's the result? Almost nothing. This year, Black Friday sales fell 11% from the prior year. But hmm. some of that was, didn't they sort of backpedal the data and it wasn't as bad as we really thought? Generally, people are shopping. They're shopping online. The growth stats for the online um, era are incredible. But in terms of people having the excitement, going, lining up, waiting for discounts that aren't actually discounts, it's going to go away. But maybe that would be a good thing, and, and maybe the retail sales will be spread out through the course of the season like they're supposed to be. I think that would, in fact, be a good thing. I think this overhype in terms of what Black Friday is supposed to represent is, is really just another way to fake discounts. Right. Dan, what about you? What do you think is going to be big next year? I have to go to tech and look at connected devices, you know, what we call the Internet of Things. And can I just say, I hate that term. <laughs> can I just say that? <laughs> go ahead. I mean, if you look around an apartment of, say, a millennial, I look at every device in my place and it's wireless, but I'm constantly wired in in a different way. You know, Jawbone's wireless speaker, Nest thermostat. I think everyone in the world is going to get more connected at all times, which you could say is sad, but it's inevitable. But is this everyone in the world or is this just really, you know, the uh, upper middle class, the people that can afford these things? I mean, this isn't, you know, not everyone is going to benefit from the Internet of Things. It's true, but if you look at these companies and their mega valuations, I mean, you look at how much money is flying around in tech in Silicon Valley. A lot of these brands that make these wireless products have gone global much faster than you'd expect. So I think maybe if 2015 is the year of being connected for the U.S., 2017 is the year of the whole world being uber connected. What else do you think is going to be big next year? I hate to say it, and I know everyone wants to talk about Uber, but I think that what this year proved is that no amount of bad press can sink this company. So I look at Lyft, which is kind of the little car challenger that can, and I think it might be a year when Lyft See, finally I folds. I disagree. I think that this is going to be the year that Uber actually meets a challenge that maybe it can't handle. I mean, I, you could I, say Uber created a market that may be mm -hmm. big enough for more than just one player. I mean, you know, the Absolutely. sharing economy is, is big. I think that's one trend we saw huge. But I think you also year. have to treat your customers um, appropriately, and I think that Uber has a little bit to learn on that front. You know, with my skeptical reporter's hat on, though, I feel like I see more and more examples of customers not caring about the same stories that we in the media put such an emphasis on. I mean, every time there's a little thing from Uber, a bit of bad behavior, I'm not sure that the average person who doesn't work in media and doesn't follow business that closely notices or cares. They just want to use Uber. So, Jen, let me ask you, what is one thing you think uh, should go away next year? What would you like to God, see the less of? I would love to see the end of the selfie, but I am afraid <laughs> to say I don't think it's going to happen. Me too. No, I think it might. It, it's been too long. It's really going to jump the shark. I think we have jumped the shark mm -hmm. on the selfie. I'm with you totally, Lee. <laughs> Uh, Dan, what about you? What would you like to see go away next year? Well, I, knew, I mean, I go back to scandals and whether those type of things matter. And what was interesting to me was that the biggest sports story of the year became a business story, you know, one of management. And that was the NFL's crisis. And it became a business story because brands and sponsors didn't necessarily back out when you thought they would. When I look at next year, I think the NFL gets bigger and bigger, along with all the other sports leagues. NBA inking huge deals with Turner. And I want to see if the various scandals with player conduct actually affect these sports leagues and the money they make. It's all about the sponsors. Jen, what is one, is there one sort of super under the radar trend that, that no one's talking about now that you think is going gonna, is gonna to emerge next year? This isn't under the radar at all, but I think that if you look at the cybersecurity um, 
the, the discussion that we're hearing everywhere. I think the idea of this um, chief security officer reporting directly to the CEO is something that we must mm -hmm. and will see. It's a board level issue now. I mean, even six months ago when I wrote a story in Home Depot, this had not really, really, really made it to the top, top, top levels of most companies, and now it has to. Definitely top of mind. I mean, every day this gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Dan, what about you for next year? Something under the radar that you think is going to break out? I think digital currency is going to have its uh, day in the sun. I mean, even more so than this year. Absolutely. I mean, if you look at our own company, Time Inc., we just announced that we're accepting Bitcoin for magazine subscriptions. You can subscribe to Fortune with Bitcoin. So, you know, are we going to see banks start to accept Bitcoin? Are we going to start to see big retailers that seem very 1.0 and very archaic bring themselves into the new age by accepting digital coin? We asked you all today on Twitter to tweet us your business predictions for 2015, and here's what you had to say. Cable TV will lose money off multiple channels opting for standalone subscription a la Netflix. Bitcoin becomes the go-to uh -huh. currency in 2015. They must have heard Dan. Robotics boom. Are any of these uh, ring true for you, Jen? What do you say? Um, I definitely think the cord cutting is going to continue. Mm -hmm. I think it's just a matter of time. And I think actually to your point, Dan, that, that football is probably one of the only things that's keeping this Absolutely. from being a, a complete and total um, running away from, from the old way. Dan, what about you? What do you make of our Twitter predictions? Well, it is interesting. I mean, if you look at Netflix, the original programming has been so good for them. But I think Amazon, too, is starting to get a handle on that. You know, this show, uh, Transparent, is fabulous. And I think you're going to see more and more of these standalone apps. HBO Go finally allowing us to have that without HBO subscription. So I agree with that one for sure. Jen and Dan, I want to thank you both for being with us today. I really appreciate it. Well, it's been a huge year for Fortune. We relaunched our website earlier this year, and just this month launched a new conference called Most Powerful Women Next Gen. And that's just the beginning. Take a look at Fortune's evolution. Fortune is one of the great iconic brands of American journalism. It is different. It's exciting. It's, it's special. I think we have been one of the most progressive companies. And success breeds success. Imagine two Fortune 50 companies inside HP. For every company like eBay, there's another Airbnb in a living room doing something really, really interesting. I'm so psyched. taught us anything, it's that the world of business moves fast. To close out our first ever episode of Fortune Live, I've got three of my own predictions for next year. Number one, in light of the hacks that have hit Sony, leaking thousands of company emails onto the web, I hope that 2015 marks the beginning of the end of email altogether. Hundreds of emails a day? Come on, it's gotten out of control. Companies will have to find new ways for employees to communicate and we'll all be the better for it. Number two, Big oil may have taken a hit this year, but hey, they should be used to it. I hope oil stays low, giving the middle class a break for once. And number three, titans of the sharing economy like Uber and Airbnb show no signs of slowing down. But that means big legacy businesses like car rentals and hotels may soon have to start partnering with them to stay relevant. If you can't beat them, join them. That's it for Fortune Live 2014 Year in Review. We'll see you back here next time.